This is Ted Mooney. I'm the Senior Director for Community Services here at the Internet Society, and I'd like to welcome you all this morning. So thank you all very much for joining us this morning. I see that at this point we have over 100 participants, and I'm uh, very gratified by that. At this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to our Chief Executive Officer, Kathy Brown. Hello, everyone. Good day to you wherever you're coming from. I'm noting in the uh, box that we have over 100 people from almost every continent in, in the world. So um, I, I find uh, this day when we get to talk with you uh, one of the most exciting days of uh, at least my year. So thank you for being here. First, I want to say uh, Happy New Year. Um, we, if, I can't hardly believe it's almost going to be February because I feel like we're still in let's go, let's go mood uh, uh, for the new year. Uh, importantly, uh, in the new year, we wanted to speak directly with you and hear directly the, uh, the activities, the concerns, uh, the urgent issues that are happening in your world. Uh, that'll be the uh, structure of this, um, this chat with you. I'm going to have Sally, uh, since she was so uh, effective last time in making sure you all got to speak to moderate uh, the conversation. Uh, with Olaf and Raul and others who are here to join us all. I wanted to just say thank you to you also for the work that our members and chapters and organizations have done over this last year. It was a very impactful year for the Internet Society. We were involved together, and this is what has been uh, very important to me, and involved together in some uh, enormously important uh, governmental um, uh, struggles and uh, processes. Uh, we have been involved together also in um, many uh, technical conversations uh, in the form of uh, our, our work out in the regions, uh, and I know that Raul will discuss that as well. And at the IETF, we had, I the number is uh, 21 uh, ambassadors to the IETF this year. Uh, taken from the, the regions from around the world. As you know from uh, the uh, annual report or the, the annual uh, message uh, to, the, to the community, we have a plan this year that concentrates very specifically on the need to connect the unconnected around the world and to address the trust and security issues. I am firmly of the belief that if we don't tackle these two big issues, the next phase of the internet will look very different from the principled uh, uh, vision that we have for ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to a trusted internet, to a globally connected, open, trusted internet. And if we stay with that mission, all of us together, uh, we know that there's work we have to do, very specific work we have to do around these two issues. So that is our focus uh, here in the staff part of the Internet Society. Uh, we know that there are urgent issues for chapters uh, in their uh, regions and in their countries that we would like to hear about as well to support. Um, and we also know that our organizational members uh, have some policy issues that are really on their mind as they seek to remain, frankly, global operators, providers, uh, and um, uh, content providers of the internet around the world. So today is the day to have that conversation as we start the new year. Uh, I'm delighted that you are all here with us. I want to thank you again for your presence at the WISIS. We had fabulous uh, help from you there uh, for the policy papers that you all helped to get us uh, ready for last year. I think we put 10 out. Uh, I believe we have three more now coming. And we need your input for those. Um, and uh, for the regional IGFs, which without you there wouldn't be. Uh, and we see that as a hugely important part of our movement, if you will, to make sure we have involved our grassroots, our bottom up. Um, process in ensuring that there is a globally connected, open, trusted, secure internet. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Sally to just give us a, a little overview of where we're going, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everybody. Um, as Kathy said, my, my job here is to, to keep us on time and also to make sure that we get a chance to hear 
from all of you. I see now 140 people on this call from around the world. I just listed or looked at, we have Togo, Tunisia, Chad, Guatemala, snowy Canada, and the Congo, um, among others. I know Geneva's on and, and many others. So um, thank you all for joining. This is, this is really tremendous. And what we want to do is give you, as Kathy said, an overview of where we're going for this year and get, your, um, get the conversation going that we hope will continue throughout the year as we embark on a, a very ambitious agenda. Um, so my first task is to turn to uh, James Wood, who's going to, our, our um, Director of Communications, and he's going to give us a, a, the overall direction for the, the campaigns and the brand and try to get in your minds how all of these things tie together. So James, over to you. Many thanks, Sally, and thank you to Kathy as well. Um, it's nice to see so many of you in cyberspace, 140 or so people seems like a very respectable turnout. Uh, for um, so just making reference to uh, our focus um, again, connecting the unconnected and building trust. We really began to uh, do more around these themes in a, in a concerted way um, earlier on last year and certainly at IGF, uh, where a lot of our messaging and activity really came together. And I think together these themes reflect our deep-seated belief that the internet is a fundamental tool for empowerment in the 21st century and that it will be the catalyst for positive change in people's lives through the creation of social and economic opportunity. That opportunity also uh, transposes itself uh, to, to an opportunity for us. We have an opportunity this year and in subsequent years to forge the internet's future. And as Kathy has pointed out, to connect billions or the next billions to a globally connected, open, trusted internet. Before uh, I get to the, the campaigns, which uh, Sally has referenced, um, I did just want to take uh, a few minutes just to talk about some of the core characteristics of our work this year. Um, we obviously have a, uh, this opportunity to shape the debate around access and around trust. We're looking to create that impact by collaborating, by coordinating and cooperating in a more efficient way and in a more effective way. What we're doing really through our plan, our action plan, and of course through the campaigns that amplify our work around the organization is integrating for impact. And that means we're taking an integrated approach to our work where we'll look to intersect our, pro our project activity across departments as much as possible and wherever it makes sense to do so, so that we continue to work together to common objectives. So our collective efforts are really going to feed into our strategic objective and uh, everyone in the organization and within the community uh, will really own a piece of this and, and play a role. So as we align, the community will be involved in a number of levels. We hope to engage you on, on several things and really your uh, uh, effect on our work will be to help make us more relevant around the world, define our story better and demonstrate the impact of our work. Secondly, um, also in reference to uh, Sally's introduction, I did just want to put some of the identity work in context um, and to reinforce the crucial role of, of, of that in, in the scope of the plan, our action plan and with our campaigns. It really is our defining framework for our activity this year. Um, as you know, we're focusing on our identity help us to help us speak with a stronger voice, become more visible, and be better known. Uh, we've already come a very long way in one year, uh, one year, one year ago, almost to the day, in drawing our organizational DNA to reassert our beliefs about the Internet Society, about our purpose, and about who we are as a community. We're now, uh, at this point in the life cycle of our identity work, in the process of applying these beliefs to our work and we're seeing how key elements of that re-energized or, or renewed identity which we've brought to the surface are helping to steer how we speak, how we act and how we look. So identity is really what is binding and connecting uh, our work uh, and is keeping us focused on our mission and of course that hasn't changed, that is constant and as a reminder, it's to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the internet for the benefit of all people throughout the world. 
So in the context of 2016, um, our identity work is the engine that is powering what, what we do in those two areas. It's guiding and informing how we go about telling our access and trust story. It's giving us the confidence to act. It's helping us to be recognized as a beacon for progress in those areas. And it's helping us determine the actions that we want to see as well. Um, and I'll, at this point, give you a very real example of, of what I mean by that. Some of you may have seen it uh, in the flesh, as it were. Uh, some, of, some of you may have heard about it. But I'd like to uh, just draw your attention to the advertising activity that we undertook around the WISIS Plus 10 review meeting in New York last month in December. The catalyst and engine for that was our identity work. The result of that activity uh, was that we had, uh, I think, a very impressive set of digital uh, display and print ads in prominent locations, including uh, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. Uh, we also had some advertising up in Washington Dulles Airport. We had print ads in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in the New York Times, coinciding with the UN uh, General Assembly um, review meeting. And combined with our media exposure in a number of prominent outlets, Kathy was interviewed live on Bloomberg TV, we had coverage in Forbes, we had an opinion piece in USA Today, as well as Kathy's physical presence in the UN Gen General Assembly itself meant that we really, really made an impression. The identity work that we're driving was really behind that uh, as, as, the, as the pillar of, uh, of our representing the pillar of our beliefs. So as we strengthen our identity further, there's gonna be more opportunity to maximize our reach, visibility and influence in, in that sort of way, including around access and trust. So that brings me on to the campaigns. And simply speaking, the campaigns are communications campaigns around access and trust, and they are a vehicle. They are merely a way to tell our story. They allow us to keep our focus on these themes, and they're made up of all the various pieces uh, that we touch um, from a communications perspective across the year. So they help to inform and guide our presence at external events, for example, across the many speaking engagements we have throughout the year, through our flagship outputs, reports, such as the Global Internet Report, and our whole ecosystem of content production and outputs, including blogs, articles, specially created materials. It goes to the news that we announce, uh, our media relations work, our social media engagement, and increasingly, as I've mentioned, uh, advertising. So our campaigns are defined by all of those components. We have two campaigns that map to our two themes. The first of these is our Internet Changes Everything campaign, which is designed to promote and increase the availability of, of affordable, reliable access to an open internet. And through that campaign, we really have the opportunity to show that the availability of infrastructure is not necessarily the only driver for getting people connected. It's what the internet enables them to do that matters. We can show the positive impact that the internet can have on people's lives. And in so doing, we can tell a more human story. In, in short, we can shine a light on the internet of opportunity. That campaign also has a natural affinity with our uh, continued focus on women in technology and promoting the voice of women in the future of the internet. At a tactical level, uh, we're using as many opportunities we, as we can to thread our access story across the year through multiple touch points. And to give you an idea, they include uh, the Mobile World Congress uh, Mobile Industry Exhibition, which is coming up in February. We will be present there uh, at ministerial level talking about barriers to access and women in technology. They include ICANN events. Um, the ICANN 55 event in Marrakesh actually coincides with International Women's Day. So our ISOC at ICANN event uh, will have a women's theme that underpins it, and we'll be doing some activities around that. Um, it goes to events like RightsCon, where access and human rights converge. Uh, also, some regional events, Africa Internet Summit, for example. Of course, our second inter-community event later on this year, and INET uh, conferences as well. So those are just some of the opportunities where we hope to have an impact and move the thinking on 
in access through our campaigns. The second of our campaigns is building trust in the internet, uh, designed to encourage actions that build belief and trust in the internet as a secure platform for open innovation. Our trust-based campaign is uh, there to tackle the issues of the moment. It's focused quite heavily on internet security as an extension of the collaborative security uh, model and thinking that Olaf and Sally pioneered successfully last year. And it's really there to tackle issues that fall out of uh, the trust uh, question, including cybercrime, privacy, encryption. Um, so we, we can really uh, move uh, perceptions on illustrating the problem and mapping out solutions. Again, a number of touch points there. Some of them are, are the same as our access campaign, Mobile World Congress, Africa Internet Summit, but there are other opportunities too where we can make an impact, including the OEC minist OECD ministerial meeting later on in the year, IGF, and of course, the Global Internet Report that this year will incorporate a strong trust theme. But of course, there are many more ways to promote our thinking um, and to expand on our projects and activities further and to elaborate on how they are interconnected this year. Um, I'm going to turn to Raul now to give you a more in-depth look uh, at development. Raul. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'm very glad uh, to have the opportunity to speak to all of you. We have at this moment more than 160 locations connected, probably more participants than that because uh, some places there are more than one people. That is very exciting having the opportunity to be in communication with all of you. Uh, as you know, the development and Connecting the unconnected is one of the of the priorities for the Internet Society. It has been one of the priorities last year and continue being one of the priorities for 2016. We have designed a, um, a, a strategy that is based on four pillars that we have already talked about that. And I will go very, very quickly through the, the those pillars and some of the things that we will be doing in, in 2016. One of the pillars is developing infrastructure. You know that we will continue doing the work that uh, we do usually uh, with regard to interconnection, uh, supporting peering forums, probably promoting together with other um, stakeholders the creation of new uh, peering forums in new regions where the, we don't have today this uh, kind of activities. We have been very successful on that in 2015, supporting the LAC peering forums, the Caribbean peering forum and also organizing the African Peering Forum that's this year, in the past year, uh, counted with more than 260 participants, uh, being really uh, an incredible forum for uh, having all the, 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 the community together, the African operators and the content providers and big companies from outside of African region coming to negotiate with them with the African operators. We will continue doing that. We will continue promoting IXPs. At this moment, we can say that uh, we have been involved in an incredible uh, number of the existing IXPs in different regions, and we are working in new regions, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, uh, beside the and, and Middle East, uh, beside the, 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 the world that is very well known that we have realized, uh, done in the uh, in Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, on, uh, on IXPs. Uh, this is an incredible work because it's not only the it's not only the opportunity to create new IXPs, but also with uh, building partnerships with other stakeholders, global and regional and local stakeholders. That uh, and with this uh, uh, joint effort, uh, we we can really uh, make a difference and, and introduce changes in the world in the way that the internet uh, works in different places. And one of our other other projects for this year is the globalization of our wireless for community uh, program that has been uh, so far uh, focused in Asia. Uh, we have uh, connected uh, connected a lot of uh, isolated villages in different. Uh, the countries in Pakistan, India, and Nepal uh, by ourselves and also supporting existing projects run by other organizations. Uh, we are globalizing this, uh, this program and this, uh, we will see uh, efforts, similar efforts in all the regions in 2016. 
this is a very incredible uh, project because uh, it's, a, it's fascinating because it's not only developing infrastructure, but also developing the communities and um, working with the communities in how the technologies can improve their lives. And, and so it's, uh, it's going through all the pillars uh, that compose our strategy. The second pillar is, uh, is the uh, building capacities and developing new leaders. Uh, we will continue with our e-learning efforts, more focused, uh, trying to align our e-learning efforts uh, to our priorities and strategic objectives. And also, we will continue with the excellent uh, work that our team has done so far in developing new leaders and with the Next Generation Leader Program that is very popular, but not only with that. And in, in 2015, we had opportunity together with other partners to work in, in, a, in a youth program on internet governance that has been incredibly successful. We will continue working on that uh, direction in, a, in 2016. The third pillar is, uh, is, uh, is building communities. And uh, one of, of the most outstanding uh, projects in this area is Beyond the Net. That is the opportunity not only to empower communities, we work, working with the communities in and uh, finding ways to use the technology for fitting the real needs, uh, but also uh, developing uh, projects that can be used as examples for other communities to show how the technology can change the, their lives. Uh, Beyond the Net is a program that is, uh, has, uh, we supported an uh, um, incredible number of projects in, in 2015. We have already committed hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars in the projects that we are supporting. We will continue with this project that is focused in the in, in chapters. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's important in in, in both uh, uh, aspects because it is a way to reach the communities, to empower the communities, to show how the technology can be used for improving the, the way that they live, but also to give uh, tools for our chapters for being relevant in their communities. And so it's the it's the the chapters act as, as the, the, the component of the inf uh, internet society that is uh, involved in the in the real uh, in the local uh, environments and so they really know what uh, it is important for the local communities and speaking about chapters and i will just in between brackets uh, the chapters are very important for expanding the the the, the reach of, of the internet society work and uh, it's a, we are a small organization of less than 100 people and so the chapters and our members are very important for really at, uh, increasing the impact of the of the work of the internet society and we are working a lot on the i, I think i can say that so we the, we have changed in the couple, last couple of years the way that the the chapters interact with the rest of the organization in the last two years, we have organized 11 chapters uh, workshops for developing their capacities. Uh, that this experience has been very successful, but we are changing that now to a different um, um, different uh, initiatives. Uh, we are launching in 2016 an initiative, an e-learning initiative for supporting the chapters, the functioning of the chapters. We will be organizing meetings with the chapters in every region, but. Uh, at meetings that we call advocacy meetings for discussing specific topics, for involving the chapters in the discussion of a specific topics that are of importance for the, the, the whole internet society. We have now the chapter advisory council, the steering committee, that is a new vehicle for strengthening the, 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 the work between the chapters and the other components, the other members and the staff and the board of the internet society. So I think that the, the, the chapters will uh, continue increasing their importance, their relevance uh, within the, the Internet Society organization. And the last uh, pillar is the, the increasing our ability to, to influence the public policy debate. And for that, I think that the main initiative, the main two is that we, are organize, we will organize some uh, um, regional conference uh, focusing in the debate about uh, development and policies around the development. Uh, trying to, to bring together different agencies and organizations working on the topic that uh, currently are working in a little isolated manner. And the other initiative that is uh, the, the, a series of studies and reports that will be produced in 2016, trying to inform the debate of the, and the, 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 the process of uh, policy making. 
Uh, I would like to defer to, to Sally Wentworth to, to add some comments on uh, what's the, 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 the policy, the public policy perspective on the development issue. So Sally, please. Thanks, Raul, and I'll be um, very quick because I'd love to get to the discussion. So I hope all of you are thinking of comments or, or questions that you would like to make as part of the discussion. Um, you know, of course, the ability to <clears throat> access the internet, um, there's a role for public policy in whether one can do that or not, whether cost of access is affordable or not. And so from, from my perspective, one of our objectives in this goal of connecting the next billion is to ensure that the policy, policies are in place that facilitate access and don't act as barriers to access. So around the world, you will have seen in the past, we've done a number of reports related to barriers to connectivity, and we will be continuing that. Particularly this year, we're going to focus on small island developing states and see if we can learn lessons between uh, the regions on, on this particular issue. In addition, uh, the notion of landlocked countries, uh, what are the specific and, and different conditions that they face uh, when they are um, uh, dealing with how to get access and, and reliant upon their geographic neighbors. Um, there's also, of course, the, there's the supply side. How do we get more infrastructure into countries and how do we do it in a way that's affordable and open and interoperable and all those things that ISOC stands for? In addition, we have to look at the demand side. Um, we are starting to observe in some countries that even when the access is available, there isn't the take up uh, that we would like to see. And so we're looking at issues of local content. Um, uh, again, affordability, what does is, what is the um, submarine cable market look like in certain places? So all of these policy factors contribute to the, the overall environment for access to the internet in countries. And finally, I think many of you would have observed if you were following the World Summit on the Information Society last year, that a lot of the internet governance debate remains focused on connectivity and access that um, people who aren't uh, enjoying the benefits of the internet um, want a voice in how that, uh, the internet is governed going forward and um, how they can participate. And so there's a big aspect of our internet governance work that is very tied to our development agenda uh, in this regard. And, and so we, we will continue to build on the sustainable development goals that were adopted last year and incorporate that into our work on internet governance um, at the multilateral level, either globally or regionally. So that is a, a snapshot of the policy and the development work related to access. Um, I think then I, oh, I'm supposed to turn to Olaf very quickly, Olaf, on the technology piece of access, and then I'd really like to open it up for questions and comments. Right, hello, this is Olaf from Amsterdam. Um, and I would almost say sunny and warm Amsterdam. But um, access, yeah, um, the support that we try to give from a technology perspective is that while building out that access, the, the, the core infrastructure relies a lot on uh, local communities, on uh, the community spirit that comes with the internet. So our work is mainly in supporting the build out of uh, um, uh, NOGs, the network operator groups, supporting the information that helps technologists to do um, um, uh, uh, internet connectivity in the right way. And we do that through our BCO program, uh, we do that through our ION program and our Deploy360 programs. Um, so that is one aspect of technology helping to uh, support the access agenda uh, community building. Um, I would also put um, in this our support for building community with respect to the mindset of open standards development, where we try to, um, I would say, bring the world to the ITF and bring the ITF to the world. Um, this year is a landmark in that sense. In my top left-hand corner, I believe I see Christian O'Flaherty from the LEC region. Um, the ITF will be going to Latin America for the first time. Um, I think that is very important. It is an example of how a local um, 
a local community has has uh, developed itself um, and and uh, uh, showed an interest in the ITF, whereby the ITF also showed an interest in that local community. And I think that's a a very important example. And one of the things that we are undertaking in the coming year is. Uh, to see if we can replicate this in, in other regions, um, specifically in Africa. So a long-term agenda uh, to get more um, involvement between those communities and get build a local community. And that, that's sort of where I want to uh, stop talking because I want to provide the opportunity for Q&A. So back to Sally. Thanks, Olaf. Um, there are a lot of questions that I'm seeing in the chat. And Ted, if there are others that you see that I miss, uh, please, of course, let me know. Um, and I, I apologize in advance if I don't get the names completely correct. Uh, we have a very big and diverse audience here. I'll do my very best. Um, Arsene offered to uh, give us a little bit of insight in her, um, ex her his experience uh, with the Next Generation Leaders Program. So Arsene, are you able and willing to speak? Yes, hello everybody, can you there hear you me? There you are, hello. Well, I, I would like to comment uh, the work ISOC is doing for the Next Gen Programs that's, that are allowing young people uh, interested in EG and what are we supposed to be able to my experience at the IIGF in Brazil uh, as an ISOC ambassador was very valuable because it helped me not only be part of discussion, but also learn live from experts, uh, all those people who are, who are, who are, who are working in, in, uh, in EG matters. It's always uh, good, you know, being uh, following events remotely or participating on mailing lists, but when you are able to go first, to, I mean, to be there live, and physically into meetings, it helps you, you know, uh, get uh, a different sense of what the IGF is and uh, helping you to get more engaged in the work. So thank you so much for ISOC, uh, to ISOC for the Next Gen program. Thank you. Arsene, thank you so much for that. Um, it's one of our, our um, flagship programs. We're immensely proud of it. And we hope that you can take that good experience and, and replicate it in, in your own country. I saw a comment from uh, Coppins, a good friend of mine from IETF London. Hello, Mr. Coppins. Um, you've had some comments in the chat about your experience in Burundi and deploying broadband and some of the other challenges that you're experiencing. That might be an interesting food for thought for the rest of the group. Are you able to speak? Mr. Coppins, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thanks to World Bank, uh, we have deployed around 1,250 kilometers of fiber optic. And now we are on the way deploying other 4,000. And you understand when you consider the size of Burundi, uh, uh, the density of uh, fiber optic in Burundi will be very high in Africa. Uh, and uh, the other thing I was talking about, the challenges and issues uh, for connecting the unconnected areas was about energy and electricity in Africa. Uh, another thing was to deploy a, enough fiber optic in rural areas. And uh, with that, if you can deploy some more um, community telecenters in order to use uh, the internet in local communities will be very important. That is my comment. Thank you. And I am leaving as my country is in some problem. Then I have to go back home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Coppins. It's great to hear from you. Um, um, there was a, a question, and maybe um, Raul, this is to you, or if um, Dawid is available. A uh, question on the progress of the Access Partnership uh, progress, uh, Project in Africa as related to the deployment of IXPs. So let me say something, Sally, and I will defer so to the, uh, our African colleagues. Uh, but the, the EXIS uh, project has been much more than just building IXPs, and we have been uh, providing training, developing capacities in different aspects. So it is a, it's, it has been a very comprehensive uh, project. But in terms of, of IXPs in Africa, 
I understand that there is uh, this moment uh, around 33 IXPs in the continent, and uh, we have been involved, the Internet Society have been involved, always in partnership with other organizations, local, regional, and global organizations. We have been involved in 20 of them. So it's, uh, in the last few years, we have done really a good job in, uh, in, in, this, in this aspect. And together with other things like the African Peering Forum that I mentioned before, we have contributed to change the situation in the traffic exchange in the, within Africa. In August last year, I heard from our uh, colleagues uh, from the African team of the Internet Society that the, at that moment, the, the, the traffic that uh, stayed in, uh, within Africa was about uh, 160 gigabits. And we departed from a situation seven years ago when we started to work on IXPs in the region, uh, a situation where almost zero was the, 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 the traffic exchange within Africa. So the, the, the change has been very, very, very huge. But beside that, uh, I, I was thinking about what does 160 gigabits mean? It is, uh, it is um, a huge amount, it's low. How to express that in a, it's in, in a, in a more tangible way? So with the help of our, uh, our uh, technical colleagues, uh, we realized that it is, uh, if we could show that in another way, saying that it is almost equivalent to one million movies per day. So when we say that's the number in that way, it's really huge. And it is creating a huge impact in the local communities, in the ability to develop new business in, uh, in Africa, and also in the impact in the prices uh, for access. So uh, this is the... Uh, the situation and the answer to the question is yes, there are still some countries that uh, the, who don't have IXPs in Africa. We are working with some of them, but the, the, the achievements uh, so far has been great. So uh, I would like to defer to the, to the African colleagues. Uh, that way, if you are there to add something to that, and I can come back later for uh, answering other questions. Yes, uh, very quickly, I would like to add to what Raul said. Uh, we have been in 30 countries around Africa under the AXIS project. Uh, that project is uh, almost completed, at least the phase where we are involved. Uh, but uh, we are going to go to two additional countries uh, this year, mainly the Central African Republic and uh, Guinea Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, Outside access, we have many projects uh, in capacity building. So we have been to Zimbabwe and we will go to other countries as well. Uh, we'll continue to help uh, IXPs that need uh, expertise. Uh, and we are also going to continue to give equipment uh, wherever needed uh, and make sure that uh, they get all the support they, they need. So if you are in a country uh, that uh, requires some kind of uh, support, uh, just uh, email me, uh, talk to us, and we'll try to find some way to help. Thanks, uh, Raul and Dawid. I hope everyone um, heard. There's a lot of progress on the on the access uh, project, and if you want to know more, I know Dawid um, would be thrilled to to answer any further questions. Um, and I, I apologize, the chat is going crazy, which is wonderful. I'm trying to keep up here. Um, John had a couple questions, I think, about um, communication. If we're going to, uh, one line I caught was, if we're going to reach the next billion, do they know who the Internet Society is? And do our chapters have the, the capacity to reach um, uh, the folks in their, in their um, communities in terms of communications and outreach? John, I hope I'm not totally misparaphrasing your question. Do you want to add anything to what I've just said? Um, I guess what I would just say is that, and I just re, I just typed this in as, you know, if we look at the number of current of ISAC current membership versus number of internet users globally, um, that percentage needs to be that ratio needs to be much higher. If we're if we're going to be able to have the kind of broad based um, public outreach that we want to achieve our goals. Um, we have to get people on board who have never participated in something like this. Um, and I know from 
building chapters in other parts of the world that is hard and we don't always have the tools to do that. Um, but it's, it's essential if ISOC is going to be able to achieve the, its goals. Uh, John, I, I think um, you're, you're, you're speaking to the converted here. I um, couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would say, you know, as of this year, I think we have 113 chapters at the end of 2015, uh, which is um, wonderful. And we've seen several more come online even in the last month. 80,000 members, and it's, it's really in all of our hands to make sure that we we bring more people into this community that can do what um, John is talking, talking about. It's, an, it's a new way of working, it's a new set of tools, but um, I, I think, John, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, so, if I can, so if I can just chime yeah. in here. here. So we, we have 80,000 members. I'm not so concerned about the chapters, but if we have 80,000 members and Facebook has 1.5 billion regular users, that's a problem. Yep, yep. We've got a long way to go. <laughs> well, and part of the problem is we've been around longer than Facebook has. We shouldn't be in this position as we are now. We, and we, we, we're playing catch up. James, I wonder if you want to weigh in. Do you have any comments on this in, yeah. in terms of the, the campaigns and the communication strategy? Yeah, just, just very briefly. And as you pointed out, Sally, to John's question, you know, I, I think to a certain extent you are preaching to the converted here. I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I have mentioned in the chat in response to this that, you know, everything that we're doing from a communications perspective is to be more outward looking. Um, it's, it's, we're not going to achieve that broad base or that, uh, that a, a, a sense of um, appealing to a, a much larger group of people or a community and one of those, you know, more of those billions of users around the world if we only talk to ourselves. We need to take our work and amplify it in the right places to attract more people to our cause, to join our, us in, in promoting and uh, reflecting our thinking in what they do and in the conversations they have so that uh, cumulatively we can continue to have more and more of an impact as we as we go through every year. So everything we're doing in communications is geared towards that. We're focused on you know building our relationships with media that will really move the needle for us and make a difference. Uh, we're focused on building our identity as really the, the springboard that will allow us uh, to do things in a new way and, and to get to that point. But of course, it is a process. Um, you know, it's going to take a little bit of, a t of time, but you can rest assured that this is absolutely the direction we're heading in. And uh, bit by bit, I'm sure that we will achieve, that, achieve it together with uh, the rest of the community. I guess, I guess I would add one last thought, and that is our legitimacy as an organization rests in part on our membership. We can't go to these policy um, talking shops and venues and point out, oh, we have 80,000 global users, we represent the internet. That just isn't gonna cut it. People are not gonna, that will call into question our legitimacy as an organization. Um, if we're talking about representing the every, everyday internet users, that's not gonna, that's just not gonna work. So we, we have to get our membership numbers up. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John. I, I think your, your point is, is extremely well taken. Um, and um, I think we look forward to talking to you further about how, how we can all do that together. Um, James has a, a, a plan and we're all, I think, fully um, committed to, to that. There was a question in the chat about uh, the Wireless for Communities program and uh, Raul, maybe you could keep us uh, or give us a bit more information about your vision for how to take that global. Yes, uh, our work uh, on, on this project has been focused so far only in, in Asia. and uh, We are expanding. We will, uh, in 2016, uh, um, uh, connect at least, uh, we will have at least one experience in, in each of the other regions. Uh, we're speaking about Latin America and Caribbean, Africa, and probably Eastern Europe, Central Asia. And the, this, um, uh, this is uh, it's not just connecting the, the people, it's finding partners for deploying the wireless network in the, in the proper communities, uh, dealing with ISPs to them, for them to provide uh, internet services using that infrastructure that, that we developed at an affordable prices, 
um, partnering with the local organizations for working with the communities in training them on how to use the the internet uh, for improving their, their their economies and the way of life uh, doing um, starting new businesses and um, buying you know, selling things uh, um, interacting using the e-government services um, promoting their products uh, and their local products local productions and so there is a, is a, a complex uh, project it's not only just uh, connecting the, uh, the the communities it's all the the, 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 the the whole package we could say but also learning uh, learning from those experiences and as I said before, trying to inform the public policy debate. Uh, so we are um, collecting data from before we start to work with those communities and monitoring how the, the, the technology impacting the, the program impacting the, in, in those communities. Uh, thanks, Raul. Um, so we're reaching the end of our discussion on access. There have been a number of comments in the chat um, that we will capture, as Ted promised. Um, there are questions about fellowships for the MENA region in particular that I noticed, and maybe how to up-level the IXP in Kinshasa, I think I saw. So there's a lot of um, great dialogue happening in the chat, and we'll be sure to capture that. Um, I wanted to turn quickly to... Um, our leaders of the um, organizational members advisory council who are on the call here, uh, Scott Mansfield, Cheryl Miller, and Christoph Steck, and see if you have any comments or questions uh, that you would like to add to this discussion about access and, and the role of ISOC. Thank you very much. This is Scott Mansfield. Can you hear me on the line? Scott, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Excellent. I'm on a uh, dodgy hotel network, so... Always good to check that it's coming through. I, I am, thank you, Sally, very much. And I'm, I'll have to say I'm very excited about the opportunities that that we have and we have been given as uh, co-chairs of the organizational members. And I'm really looking forward to this year and helping to advise the ISOC leadership. I also want to say that this has been an extraordinarily enlightening uh, opportunity to hear from the community as well and the one thing that, that I would like to highlight is I think it is important that we consider that access provides these opportunities but once we provide the opportunities through these connectivity options then that is really where a lot of hard work begins because now we need to have the support the affordable devices the accessible technology the education in order to actually use this and create opportunities around the um, opportunities provided by the network. So that's one of the things I would like to uh, continue to explore. So now thank you very much and I will put, I will turn it over to uh, Cheryl Miller from Verizon who will provide her comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate and I think that so far everything that ISOC has laid out is quite impressive and it's very exciting to get started and hit the ground running in 2016. I just wanted to touch on a couple of the broad themes that I heard really quickly um, and provide a couple of inputs. I think the overall theme of access is, and trust is spot on. We picked up the theme of connecting the next billion at last year's IGF and I'm glad to see that that work is continuing. Um, the way that ISOC has sort of structured both your development plan and your policy um, plan under moving act the bucket of access forward, I think is very good. Um, it, within that, I think from a business standpoint, it is really important. And I think the business community will be focusing on education around policies that help to better uh, facilitate investment um, and also uh, infrastructure. I think um, another broad theme that will sort of sort of ties in with this, uh, and it's not exactly related to trust, but I think this year it's going to be important for us to further build trust in the multi-stakeholder model. And ISOC has always had a key role in this. I think uh, a great uh, example was the role that you played as a convener with respect to the WISIS and the IGF. And I think that that separate bucket of trust also plays into a lot of the work that we'll all be doing together as a community moving forward. Um, I really loved hearing the focus on regional IGFs. I think that they can continue to be strengthened 
Uh, many of them had provided inputs into the Connecting the Next Billion project that we had at the IGF, which was great to see. Um, also, the youth IGF program was really great to be a part of. Verizon was a sponsor, and I hope that ISOC really continues to build that. I think it's going to be um, crucial because, you know, whether or not we want to admit it or not, uh, I think the younger generation, at least in my case, you know, they grew up with this technology in a way that not even I did. And so it's going to be really important to have them to continue to be a part of the conversation. Um, and then I just note with respect to uh, some of the comments around communication and membership and how do we improve that and how do we build on that? I do think you know we need to think creatively. I think it's really every member of ISOC's job to sort of be an ambassador um, and to kind of spread the word about the good work that ISOC is doing. And I think um, maybe we can even look further to see how we can sort of build out that with respect to perhaps global pub public schools, colleges, et cetera, because I think there's a lot of energy there that we can tap into and kind of move forward with respect to education and getting the word out on stuff that you're doing. So I'm sorry I talked too much, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, Christoph, did you want to add anything from an organizational member perspective? Uh, I mean, we heard a lot, and I think it was really interesting, and, and it's uh, fantastic to be part of that crowd and to see uh, all the ideas flying in uh, on the chat. Um, I just uh, would want to, do, to stress uh, maybe two or three issues on the connectivity part and how we can get people to use the internet. Um, I work for Telefonica, so you might imagine that, that we are quite involved in that and we're trying to give access um, and broadband access to people in, in the markets where we operate. And what we experience is that, first of all, um, when we speak about connecting uh, the next billion, we will have to speak about mobile access. Um, of course, we will need parts of the network to be built by fiber. Uh, there might be also roads of satellite and of other technologies, whatever you have. But it's going to be mainly uh, mobile technology which is going to connect um, these next uh, billion of people. And then um, the second part, and that was mentioned already, and it's related to the supply and demand side issue you mentioned, Sally, as well, is that we believe that the demand side actually, in a lot of cases, uh, is where we have to work much more with uh, other stakeholders, with governments, to make people aware that there is actually a use in the internet and that they also have the skills to use it. Um, I think that ISOC has uh, published interesting studies. Uh, Michael uh, Candy has done that uh, from Brazil, where you see that actually the connectivity in itself is not the issue. It's rather that people say, I have no interest or I don't, I don't know how to use the internet. And I think this is where we really hit um, a wall in, in getting the internet rolled out in the sense that it's used by people. Um, so the first step is connectivity, but the second step, of course, is getting people to really use it. And I think that's where um, actually we would, would want to reach out as ISO to other partners. And there are many people involved in there, not only governments, other institutions, a lot of companies uh, like mine and others. And I suppose we should really uh, try to, to combine here the efforts um, to make uh, the internet available to everyone. That would be, um, I think, a key role for ISAC to play. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph, and thanks to our advisory council leaders. Um, we have a, a new advisory council this year that we are, we are thrilled that it's uh, come together, uh, the chapter advisory council. And I'm gonna turn to Richard Hill and Avri Doryev to uh, give us their insights on how the chapter advisory council is thinking of these issues and uh, any other comments you want to make with regard to the discussion so far. Uh, hi, this is Richard. If hey. Avri is there, I'll defer to Avri. Okay, Avri, over to you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so basically, I mean, the, 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 the chapter's advisory is just getting started. And we're, we're, we're finding our footing we're, we're still in the process of figuring out how we work. But one of the things that I think is, is very certain is that we do plan to get the chapters more involved, both in, in helping to sort of communicate with the broader community of users, but also to bring uh, their input in. Haven't quite figured out how that happens yet. Haven't quite figured out what, what the priorities are and looking in terms of the priorities that ISOC has already set up for this year and, and going forward, how, how we actually blend into that. So very happy to see, you know, many of the initiatives, very happy to see uh, 
you know, the sort of the focus on rights that, that Isaac has taken and, and is becoming very much one of the leading voices in that. So, so that is a very good thing to see, uh, you know, and, and, and such. So I think we're very supportive. We don't quite know how to be supportive yet uh, and, and, and what we can actually uh, do to, to affect things. But, but, you know, we're, we're actually very excited to be part of all this and to be moving along. So I'm just going to jump in here and say how delighted I am that uh, the chapter advisory uh, council is up and running. And um, I think there's a lot you can do. And I hope we have a, a, a long and deep dialogue about that. But I also, I, I'm, the reason I'm jumping in is to publicly, again, congratulate Avery for her statement uh, during the WISIS. It was quite moving. Uh, it was quite um, impactful. And uh, you know, it just gave me one of those fabulous uh, moments when I know that we do come together as a community uh, to voice uh, where we are in that community in ways that are very impactful. I really wasn't speaking on behalf of uh, ISOC, but it was, um, you sort of want to claim that she's part of us <laughs> when she speaks so well. So I wanted to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Sally. And I think I'm going to turn to, directly to uh, Richard Hill uh, to give his thoughts on the advisory council. Uh, yes, actually, I was right to defer to Avria because she said what I was going to say much better. So uh, I want to echo that. And I just wanted to add two points. From uh, As Avri said, we're just getting off the ground, so it's very early days. But from some of the initial feedback uh, we're getting, uh, and that's actually why I think one of the reasons the, the advisory council was created, it echoes what's been said earlier in this meeting. Um, it would be good to involve the chapters more actively in various activities. And uh, for example, when I was listening to the activities on um, connecting the unconnected, uh, maybe it would be possible for ISOC to coordinate with the local chapter leadership uh, when making local visits uh, and doing local initiatives uh, and so on. I realize that doesn't always work, uh, but it's something that's worth trying. Uh, and then on the trust area, and by the way, I share what uh, most people have said, that we, uh, uh, we, I think we all agree that the um, key, key objectives you've outlined, connecting the unconnecting and building the trust, are exactly the right ones. So I, I strongly support that. Uh, now, I have a personal view on, uh, on the trust issue. But I think it's shared by a large number of people. We've see, we, we know that uh, we have to kind of have some proportionate uh, activities with respect to surveillance, collecting private data, retaining private data, and so on. And I think we're seeing increasing uh, adoption now of the, uh, or endorsement of the necessary and proportionate principles, which ISOC itself uh, has also endorsed at a very early stage. And I see that now in the Council of Europe documents and in a resolution from the Interparliamentary Union. So I think maybe it's worth uh, keeping that in mind as we go forward and, and really make the point that yes, we do need surveillance, obviously, but it has to be um, <clears throat> under, under law and with appropriate safeguards and due process necessary and proportionate. Uh, so thank you very much. And we are, as Ari said, looking forward to really getting rolling in the advisory group. Um, Sally, okay. may, may I say something very quickly? Yes, and then we're going to head into the trust agenda. Go ahead, Raul. Yeah, but, just, but just a very quick comment on what Richard said, and I, I already wrote it in the chat room. It's a, we fully agree about the importance and the need of involving the chapters more in all of our programs, including the, the access uh, of projects and programs. Just that. Thank you, Richard, for saying that. We fully agree. Uh, thanks, Raul. Um, there are several questions in the, in the chat that we didn't get time to address, but we, um, we will try to get to all of them uh, either through the chat or here, but we, can't, uh, we don't have enough time to get to everybody. Um, so Richard kindly um, helped us shift the debate or the discussion um, to the trust aspects of our agenda which is a perfect time for me to then turn over to Olaf Kolkman, our Chief Internet Technology Officer, to give us an overview of um, our work this year on um, in ensuring and rebuilding or building uh, trust in the internet. So, uh, Olaf, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sally. And I'd like to start with a quote that I just, or just point attention to something that I just read in the chat. It's a uh, uh, a little while back by CM Mananapali, I hope I pronounce his name right, but CM lives in India 
And um, his uh, taxi account, uh, apparently there is some value in, in, in an account that is associated with the taxi, um, uh, 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 got stolen and transferred. And um, looking for redress, he couldn't found the, find that redress. Um, Siam is, has been active in the ITF and still feels that the internet is not a safe place. And I think that sort of touches upon the core of um, what the trust agenda is about. What we need is an internet that we can trust to do our business, to bring us economic opportunities where people feel safe. And there are multiple aspects to a trust agenda there. Um, there is a trust agenda with respect to how people can find redress. So there is a, a you know, how does, how does your loss and how does your safety, your continuity in normal life uh, 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 depends on, 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 on an environment, so to speak. <clears throat> on the other hand, um, in order to create an environment where those hacks don't really take place, we also need to do technical implementation. So a trust agenda is a, is a whole broad context going from uh, uh, policy measures to all the way down to, uh, to, to technical measures. Um, last year, um, in 2015, we uh, launched a, a piece called uh, Collaborative Security. And Collaborative Security is a, is a, is a set of values, as a framework to look at um, 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 a cyber security and internet security um, from a perspective whereby policy measures that we take to address the issues that uh, Siam runs into, so to speak, uh, do not impact um, the value that the internet brings. It is also taking into account that security is not one it cannot be achieved in one place by one actor and by one principle or one action. It is intrinsically on the internet, multi-layered, multifaceted, and, and um, a, a responsibility um, of all. So that is sort of what we try to convey with the collaborative security uh, context. Now, implementing that in a trust agenda, um, we're sort of looking into uh, uh, a number of things uh, from, from the, the society's perspective. Having trust means you need to have policies for trust. Um, and for us, the collaborative uh, security model is one of those, those building blocks, so to speak, for uh, looking at, at, at individual policies and, and, and bringing that debate forward. You need to have an understanding of the economics of trust. Um, trust needs to be interoperable, so to speak, for lack of a better word that pops to mind, with, with, with values, with human rights, for instance. So trusted internet and human rights go hand in hand. Um, we want to make sure that the technology bits that allow users to trust the internet are in place. So now we're sort of going more a little bit more into what is the future technology that can support users in, in, in looking at trust. We want to advance those trust technologies. We want to make sure that the public core of the internet, as some observers yeah. call it, um, uh, can be uh, can be secured. So then we're talking about um, things that we, we 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 try to progress, like like the routing manifesto. And then, of course, we want to get a feel of how secure is the internet anyway. How can we measure that? So there's a bunch of activities that we undertake, and and from the technology uh, perspective, we're really looking at uh, enhancing user trust advancement of trust technologies such as encryption, such as TLS. That's where, uh, for instance, our Deploy360 program uh, creates a lot of material and we're looking at the online courses to support that. But we're also doing work in deploying DNSSEC, uh, the Manners Initiative, where we try to create a, uh, um, a set of, of um, uh, um, operators that 
subscribe to those values of uh, let's make that internet uh, interconnection more secure. Um, and then on the higher layers, there are a number of policy actions that we try to take, which I alluded to, but Sally, you can probably talk a little bit more about that. And I, I wanna keep this short so that we have a little bit more time to you know, get into a conversation. Sally. Thanks, Olaf. Um, you know, one of the things, again, that we observed in the WISIS, there was a, a debate over language related to security, and a number of governments suggested that um, while the technical community could go off and do the technical aspects of security um, in whatever fashion, multi-stakeholder or otherwise, that um, the, the policy aspects of security really were the domain of governments and that they should make those policies um, on their own and in some sort of multilateral context. And we pushed back on that concept in line with the collaborative security framework that Olaf mentioned because we really do believe that, that security, to create a secure and a trusted internet environment, you have, these pieces have to work together. Uh, the policies that are created, um, and we're having a big debate in the world around encryption, if there are policies related to encryption that emerge from that, they will affect the technical layers. Um, aspects of how the technology evolves with respect to privacy or doesn't will impact uh, the policy layers and what governments think they need to do. So we believe really firmly that this, uh, our notion of multi-stakeholderism really comes to the fore in the, con in the discussion around security. Uh, because it, it, no one person is going to push a button somewhere and make us all secure online. We know this. and We have to do this as a, as a collaborative endeavor. Um, for us on the policy side, uh, that notion of governments do security and technologists do technology is very pervasive in the government policy discussion. And we as a community really need to push back on that and show our value uh, that we can bring to the conversation from a technology or an industry or an end user point of view. Um, we are looking this year to build out from the collaborative security framework what are the policy building blocks that lead to a trusted internet environment? Uh, what are the pieces that need to be in place? We hear this a lot, particularly in developing countries. You know, I, I can't do everything all at once, but if I could do five things related to security from a policy perspective, what would they be? And we would really love to hear from you um, in your vantage point what you, what you think some of those building blocks uh, would be. And we'll be coming back to you um, for dialogue on that this year. And of course, any discussion of security and trust um, is, is not complete unless we keep the human rights aspects at, at the forefront of our minds. Uh, that our goal here is to create an open, interoperable internet where people can express themselves freely and express themselves securely. So the, the human rights component of all of this is, is quite important. And um, we're building partnerships with, with the human rights community that do the human rights pieces very well, but are keenly interested in understanding the technology aspects uh, for themselves, for their own personal security in their countries, but also for um, the freedom of expression concerns that they're advocating in their countries. So there's, there's a huge policy component, I think, that's emerging and has been emerging for some time related to creating a trusted internet environment, and that's what we want to pursue very strongly this year in 2016 and be a real leading voice on that. Um, I think my, my job now is maybe to turn to Raul, talk a little bit more about the regional dimensions of our trust agenda before we open it up for further questions. Raul? Thank you, Sally. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a, 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 lot, a lot to do from the global engagement perspective. The global engagement the teams that uh, include all the, the regional teams and, and also the capacity building activities and, uh, and the relation with the chapters. And the, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways in which uh, we will be collaborating to the uh, contributing to the security trust and security of objectives in 2016 is, uh, is through our e-learning activities, uh, supporting the, the, the work that is being done by the, the policy group and the uh, technology group. But also bringing the discussion through our regional work to the 
technical community, through the network operator groups and the regional debate, uh, bringing the, trying to feed the debate uh, with our expertise and the, uh, on, uh, again uh, trying to combine the, the work that is being done in, by internet society in terms of policy and technology, trying to feed so the, 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 the regional debate and using our engagement tools and our engagement networks in the regions to promote the concept of collaborative security and also to use the, co the collaborative security approach for a specific discussions and, uh, and, and specific cases. Um, finally, promoting the multi-holder discussion and the, at the regional and, and local level. Those are some of the things that uh, we will do in 2016 for supporting the work that the organization is, uh, is, is, being, um, is, is doing on collaborative security. And, and trust agenda. Thanks, Raul. Olaf, do you have any other um, concluding remarks or questions you want to raise before I turn it over to the to the group? Well, no, but I saw a question in the chat room from uh, Dr. Sadi, uh, Sahid Siddiqui about how do you handle the situation when government itself put regulation uh, uh, on the name of the internet security? So. Um, if, um, if that happens, how does that fit in the collaborative security model? I think that what is very important is that um, understanding what type of impact um, proposed regulation has on the values um, uh, that we want to preserve with uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, the collaborative security model is very important. In essence, what we say is we want to pre preserve the values that the internet has made the internet gr grow permissionless innovation, end-to-end -end connectivity, global reach, those type of things that we um, um, are captured in the Internet Invariance paper. Um, but also values like uh, um, um, uh, the, the human rights. Um, so taking that perspective back and, and specifically uh, looking at the Internet Invariance and your technical competence in, in uh, uh, bringing your technical competence into that discussion and assess whether the regulation will impact any of those values. Um, that, of course, is always sort of a, 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 a local and a, and, a, and a very targeted discussion that is relevant to your sphere, but taking that Overall, look, I believe that, that our collaborative security uh, framework might help in, in, taking that, um, uh, in, in taking an approach there. Um, I hope that sort of gives you a little bit of context on, on how I uh, uh, think of, of how that could be useful in that context. Uh, thanks, Olaf. Um, I want to come back to a comment Richard Hill made uh, earlier on necessary and proportionate. Um, because that's quite a big uh, deal in this discussion. Richard, maybe for those who aren't um, as familiar with that, that phrase in, this, in the security and trust context, do you want to elaborate a little further on what you mean by that and why you think that's important? Sure. Uh, thank you for that, Sally. Uh, there was a fairly large coalition of uh, civil society organizations that got together. I think it must have been about three years ago now. Uh, it was pretty much after the Snowden revelations, and they produced a, a set of principles which in their view would be the correct balance between, uh, as I've seen on the, on the list here, between uh, security, uh, law enforcement, uh, privacy, uh, data retention, uh, legal intercepts, uh, surveillance, and so on. And the website is actually necessaryandproportionate.org. Uh, with no spaces, just type that and you'll see it. Uh, ISOC was one of the early um, uh, adherents to that, as uh, ISOC itself central and, and several ISOC chapters also. Uh, that idea has uh, come up here and there. Uh, some governments uh, have, uh, well, in fact, I think actually it's fair to say all governments <laughs> have shown some reluctance in adopting those principles, I think, because they felt that it would constrain their existing surveillance programs. It's clear that m most of these surveillance programs in place, not just the one from the U.S., which is well known, but all the other ones which we don't know about and which are even worse, uh, would not be acceptable under the uh, necessary and proportionate principles in one way or another. Uh, but nevertheless, civil society has been pushing. As I mentioned, this principle is now coming up in, uh, even in intergovernmental bodies. 
It was uh, unanimously proposed by civil society in the WISIS review, but it didn't wind up in the WISIS uh, outcome, but that's okay. You know, we can, uh, we can keep trying. And the basic idea behind it is just what it says. Surveillance, yes, but it has to be necessary for safety, security, and so on, and it has to be proportionate, meaning basically not mass surveillance, but targeted surveillance based on uh, some evidence uh, of threats or things like that and under judicial supervision. Thanks for that, Sally. Thanks, Richard. It's, it's becoming, as you said, a, a sort of core part of the, the international policy debate on these issues. Uh, Nick Ashton Hart is in there. He had a comment in the queue about um, let's, not, let's not get dragged into this balance that we have to trade off certain things in order to get trust or privacy. Nick, do you want to expand on that point? Um, sure, if you like. Um, yes, please. <laughs> now, this is just, uh, this is kind of a hobby horse of mine because, of course, I sit in Geneva and listen to lots of discussions about the internet, mostly not terribly well informed on parts of many delegates. <clears throat> and, and even just the sort of public narrative where you know, law enforcement says, well, we have to have access to your communications when we need to in order to protect you. And uh, <clears throat> to me, this is like saying, well, we need a policeman to live with you. So in case someone invades your home, we'll be there to help you. No, you don't get to live in my house. You don't get to live in my head. And, and I, I, I think this is one of the key challenges that we're going to face as a community <clears throat> is the law enforcement community has tended to be pretty insular. They, they hang out together. They, they work collaboratively together. In the past, uh, they, that worked. They, they needed some engagement by the sort of justice ministries and, and lawyers, but uh, they had to collaborate with each other. And I, I think we, we need more engagement with especially younger, more technically savvy people from law enforcement to get them to understand that uh, a zero-sum game isn't the way to a more secure society and that uh, security issues are not owned by law enforcement or security services or by anybody, that uh, human rights is a key part of security and and this is really a holistic, we, we should want a holistic result. And I have to say I compliment ISOC because the messages from ISOC managed to be congruent, as I mentioned in there, congruent, moral, and uh, fact-based all at the same time. And that's a difficult combination on a technical subject. Um, and this community, I think, has a lot to add if there's a way to connect more with, with, with law enforcement communities Outside of the limelight, not, uh, not, not at the sort of level of public discourse where you see so much conflict, but um, maybe there are some opportunities for ISOC and some meetings at Europol or Interpol or to convene some sort of small group meetings with people where some of the, some of the more interested people from these communities could maybe ask questions in, a, in an off-the-record environment and understand a bit better why the reaction is so negative to what they, what they propose at times. Um, thanks, uh, Nick. Olaf, I don't know if you have any follow-up to that. Of course, the issue of, of law enforcement and encryption is, um, is a really difficult one. It's happening in many of our countries uh, as we speak, and certainly something the technical community is paying a lot of attention to. But Olaf, do you want to speak a little bit more about that tussle as you see it? Yeah, oh, um, yeah, it's a, a tough, tough topic. Um, as you know, um, there are also um, uh, technical counter reactions to this. Um, uh, the, the ITF a couple of years has set in motion, um, uh, 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 I would say almost a policy, but it's probably the wrong word, but uh, 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 more encryption, make sure that all the, uh, uh, the protocols that are developed in, in that community uh, support encryption. And um, uh, in fact, I believe that we at the Internet Society, we at the Internet Society supported that statement, um, but we are also working on um, spreading uh, the knowledge and the word on how to um, uh, create those um, uh, security and implement those security mechanisms through our, uh, through our programs. Uh, support of DNSSEC, support of TLS in your protocols. Um, those things do not only protect you 
um, against uh, uh, per pervasive monitoring. No, the primary goal of that is to protect you against criminals, to protect you against uh, the guy that uh, uh, hacks your, um, your, your taxi account and steals all your money. Um, and I think it is very important to um, take that positive look in addition to uh, the defensive uh, posture um, that there is a job to do in, in, in securing our, our, our immediate environment, so to speak. Um, and there is a lot to do. Um, if we only look at the Internet of Things, um, then we're shipping uh, material that if, and implementations that are not secure, and we collectively have a responsibility there. So uh, making that part of the debate, I think, is very important. A positive and uh, uh, initiative-based uh, stance, uh, taking responsibility for your piece of the security agenda. I think that that is important. Uh, thanks, Olaf. I'm going to take one more question that I uh, saw in the queue. There's a lot of stuff coming in here, but um, Dr. Shahid asked a question about um, what he referred to as a double-edged campaign going on in India. Um, Dr. Shahid, are you able to speak, and do you want to describe that a little further? I actually heard about it on the radio a bit this morning, so I think I know what you're referring to, but could you tell us in person? Yes, yes, Ali. I can uh, just give you some example in India of what's happening. It's uh, it's like you know one side that we call it that Digital India campaign is going on, but one on the other side, if somebody speaks about the situation that's going on in the environment, either on the social media or in any format, so that person is being targeted indirectly or directly through the system or something like that, they have to suffer. So in every campaign, in everywhere you might be hearing on the media itself, even the celebrities are just uh, afraid to speak about the things happening. So it's like, you know, one side you tell that yes, Digital India is necessary, it should be connected all over. But the, what is the reality? The so reality is that it's nothing on the remotest area. If you get, go and I still see, there are lots of national fiber networks available, but they are not active. They are not being used. They are not being utilized. But the, on the other side, in the media campaign, you just see that it's campaign going on all around. So I think it's a very dangerous situation that, you know, one side you speak in the favor, but in practical, it's not in the favor. It's like just countering that what you want to say, that should be only the digital on the digital platform and others are not getting the space for delivering their speeches or delivering their expression. So this is what I just wanted in this situation, how one can advocate about the rights of internet or accessibility or that getting into the mainstream, those who are already disconnected. As you know that 60% of the Indian population is, in the, in the, is totally disconnected. More than that, they are even, they're just not having the accessibility of even the electricity, most of the villages you go and see. And we, in that situation, how we can think about the internet? So that is the question that you we talk, we talk, just it goes to the only 20% or 15% of the population, those who have the accessibility, those who have the uh, digital readiness, that's all. So we have to think that in the, uh, as you spoke about Africa, Africa is also going through the same situation. There are all things like uh, going haywire, it's like it's not totally disconnected where we are targeting, we are not reaching to that point. So I'm just, just bringing those into notice that how we can just uh, work practically and just get into that to solve those issues. Because if we uh, start campaign, uh, if I talk about individuality, I cannot do that freely because there are lots of things uh, as a blockade. So just, I wanted to just bring this in notice and how I just need the solution. I, you people are uh, expert here, so you can just guide us that how to handle those situation. Uh, Dr. Shahid, I think you've, you've raised a, a very good point and one that we hear in, in a lot of countries. And in fact, what I had heard on the radio coming in this morning was this, this tension um, in the, you know, that human rights organizations are starting to, to see um, in countries where, well, on the one hand, they want access, but they want that access to be controlled. They want it to be in, on their own government terms and not necessarily on the terms of the user. And that is something that they're starting to see a real, and they're documenting an uptick in this kind of approach around the world. And it's something we as a community need to be really mindful of. 
at the Internet Society, we, we believe in access, but we believe in access to a global, open, interoperable Internet where people can expect, express themselves freely. We have to build on these trust components. We have to make it more secure. We have to protect people's privacy, but that should not come at the expense of, of free expression. So um, I think you raise a really valid point and one that we are all as a community going to have to work through and struggle through for the, for the coming years. It's, it's one of the, the key tensions that, that we see. Um, I want to turn now, as we did before, to our advisory councils just to see if you have any additional comments you want to make on the, the trust aspects of the agenda. Um, so to our, uh, I'll switch it up this time, although we've already heard from Richard, so maybe Avri um, for the chapter advisory council, uh, any comments that you have? Obviously, you're very active in the human rights discussions around the world. Um, anything you want to say on this, on this piece of the agenda? Hi, uh, Avri again. Probably not too much. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to see it taken up. I, I really do see that, that tussle as being something we have to engage in, and I'm really quite happy that, that Isaac is, is engaging in it, and it is definitely something that, that we can't let up on as we see more and more of, of, of the problem areas. So, but that's you know, really all I need to add. I, I think it was well said. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Richard, anything else you want to add? I don't know if Richard's still with us. Okay. Um, if you want to jump in, just come. Um, oh, the answer is no. So thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, maybe turn over to uh, the advisor, the organizational members, uh, Christoph, Cheryl, and Scott. Uh, anything you want to add to this portion of our discussion on trust and security? Hi, this is Scott. I'll just uh, jump in real quick and say that I think it's important for the organizational members to exercise their networks to use that as a way to provide educational and outreach to educate everybody about the importance of, of trust. I mean, it's important for people to understand what's available, what tools are available, and how to use those tools. So I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Cheryl. Hi, this is Cheryl. Um, you know, I, I think it's great that you guys are focusing on this because it is a really important issue. It has many different dimensions to it. I think you said something really important, Sally. You said internet on users' terms. And, you know, that's exactly right. Um, as someone who wants to gain access and wants to be a, a bigger participant in the internet community, um, how are you able to kind of navigate your way through on your own? Uh, we do a lot of research just with respect to, um, you know, our own customers with respect to privacy. And I can tell you some of the things that I've learned is there are so many demographic cultural nuances to how people feel about many different things in terms of their interactions online. Um, and I do think that there are, there are different sort of um, dialogues and buckets with respect to when you're talking about crime investigation or you're talking about broader types of data collection. A lot of the points that were raised um, by many who have participated in the conversation, I think are spot on with respect to encryption. Um, I think also routing security is another bucket of that. There's an overall safety bucket that pulls in items such as child online protection and things of that nature. And so I look forward to a really detailed uh, dialogue on this. It needs to be ongoing uh, for sure, and I'm glad that Internet Society is taking it up in the way that it is. Thank you. And finally, Christoph, anything you want to add? I think we all agree that encryption might be a key issue around, around uh, encryption, uh, around trust, but I believe that we have to do much more work on that. I think it's a very challenging issue, as we have uh, just said. Um, there are many different interests involved. Uh, when we speak about governments, uh, they, of course, you know, depending on where, where you, uh, whom you speak to in government, have different opinions on it, on it themselves. And I just believe that we, we have to do much more work on that. It's, of course, not true that encryption will be the only way to provide privacy. And at the same time, it's also true that encryption will prevent any security. So the truth is here very much in the middle, and we have to find out uh, where it is. And I think, again, um, I think Internet Society, with this expertise from technology side, with the expertise of its chapters, should really try to build bridges here and not, you know, 
being being afraid of having an opinion, but rather try to build the opinion of others as, others as well. I mean, it's not going to be black and white here. It's going to be a solution which needs to balance a lot of fundamental rights and interests, and we have to be aware that uh, we should be part of that debate and not, not outside. So I think that would be just my point to add to that. If I may, uh, if I may uh, Christopher, uh, I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's something that, um, that we recognized when we made our statements um, and something that uh, we've tried to bridge uh, um, during the last year, specifically, for instance, by co-organizing a workshop be, uh, to look at the, at, at the technical implications of security, of, of encryption, uh, for instance, in mobile networks. Um, there are many aspects to that, and, and it's important to, uh, to, 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 to look at those. And um, as a comment back to Cheryl, um, uh, the various perspectives that people have, the local pockets of uh, interpretation of values, of, uh, uh, of, of approaches with respect to the um, security and privacy and, and uh, uh, the social components of that. I think that is a case for the subsidiarity nature of this discussion, the multi-stakeholder bottom-up type of discussion that takes place. And I think that, um, um, lessons learned um, uh, could be transferred between the chapters. I saw Richard mentioning in the uh, chat room uh, uh, that there is a, uh, uh, the, the Swiss chapter has organized something around the, 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 the encryption uh, uh, bills that are uh, being introduced. And I think that um, uh, translating those examples and perhaps informing other chapters might be one of the things that we can do in this, in, in the, in this debate. So, those were my sort of final observations from this, from this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf, and thanks for, for summarizing. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I'm just going to, to put a plug in um, <clears throat> for a, a one last project that we hope we can get the community engaged in. We've spoken a lot so far about what we need to do in 2016. We have a critical agenda ahead of us. Um, but one of the roles of the Internet Society is to always be looking further out. Um, and what does the future look like? And so we are going to embark on a project this year to update, uh, revise, uh, reconsider the, the scenarios that are facing the Internet. What are the directions that the Internet could be going? And how do the decisions that we make, either in policy or industry or as users or as uh, engineers, how do those decisions affect uh, the ability of the internet or ability of all of us to, to experience the internet that we want to experience? Um, and we want this to really be a community uh, brainstorming session, so to speak. Um, and so as we walk through the process of building these scenarios, we'll be coming out to many of you to, to get your sense of what are the the challenges facing the internet, what are some of the uncertainties, what are the things we don't know but we think are on the horizon, and then how do we translate those into recommendations for what we should all do as a community going forward. This isn't going to happen overnight, this will be something that will unfold over the coming year, year and a half, uh, but we really do want this to be a, a community engagement uh, project. And so. Uh, we, we hope that you're ready to, to jump in and, and um, put your creative hats on and think about the future, uh, particularly from where you sit. Uh, and we've, when we've done this in the past, we get different perspectives from different regions based on the challenges that they're experiencing. So um, that's a, a plug for uh, looking ahead, looking into the future. And um, with that, I'm going to wrap up this discussion portion and turn it back to Kathy. Uh, to conclude. Thank you, Sally. So thank you all for participating um, in my morning and your day, morning, afternoon, and night. It's, um, it's, it's um, very motivating to sit and listen to the views of our members uh, around the world and to keep, for us to keep in mind uh, the meaning of this word society. I have always been quite enamored of our, of our name, the Internet Society. And I think I've said this before, but this idea arose from 
meant back when this whole thing started about the society is going to emerge from this idea of the internet. And it has, and it has. Uh, someone said earlier, yeah, yeah, but there's so many more people on the internet than are in our membership. And that's right, that was bound to happen. Um, the issues around an open, globally connected, secure, trusted internet uh, remain for us even more urgent, in my view, 25 years, which will be our anniversary next year, into the birth of this idea, this internet society. And you heard today a lot about what I believe are the urgent things we need to do in the present time to meet the current challenges. I actually believe that if we don't do this, and we don't do this with some, um, some passion and some direction and some activism, that we could see a very different world and a very different internet than the one that uh, we believe in. The core of our ability to do this is not the 90 people who are the staff of the Internet Society. The core of our ability to do this is our membership. So 80,000 members, have we engaged them all? No. Do we need to? Yes. How do we do that? How do we think about our members, growing those members, and then activating them to move forward with us to ensure that we have the Internet that we want in the future? There's a couple of ways I think that we are concentrating on and that we ask you to do. Part of this is local organization. It is locally organizing folks to, to talk about, to understand, to be aware of the, the issues that affect the internet. One way to do that is on the internet. And I, I just the reason you are sitting here in little boxes in front of me is because I'm a deep believer that we need to make eye-to-eye -eye contact. We need to talk to each other in a way that we realize we're not just names on an email or voices on a uh, teleconference, but that we are real people sitting in real places everywhere in the world, and we call ourselves a society. Together, this society can come together, in my view, to, um, to take on what are the issues of the internet in the 21st century. We are trying to here, uh, at the staff level, focus those efforts so that we can be more effective. We are, uh, we are aware that there are very discrete issues on the local and regional level, which we must depend upon our people in those regions to address. We want to give you the tools. We want to give you the policy papers. We're trying much harder to say to you here, here are the things you need that you're telling us you need to do the work of the Internet Society. This year, you'll see from us a, a, a increased and continuing uh, focus on building the society, on building our membership, on building the strength of our chapters, on making sure we can communicate with each other. And by the way, it doesn't only have to be through us, although I think these community forums are fabulous. You can communicate with each other within your chapters and regions. You can communicate with each other across the chapters. And I would hope that you would do that because I think there's so many lessons learned around the world. As I go around the world and listen to what people are doing, it's quite um, uh, it's forceful. It's impactful. If it's focused, it really, really gets things done. So what are we going to do? Keep using the internet to talk to each other, to organize. This particular application we're using here is a good one. Why? It's cloud-based and thus the uh, low bandwidth issues in some of the places in the world get, get dealt with. So you heard people from places around the world today and you saw them that you could not do uh, just a little while ago because of the, the, the technological breakthroughs. I don't necessarily want to be the cheerleader for one particular application, but what I'm seeing is an application that we're using that is working, and I'm suggesting to you to do it, to find it, to get online looking at each other and talking to each other. We are going to, again, do intercommunity. Last year, to be honest, we were just holding our breath to make sure the technology worked, that we could actually move ourselves around the world from our board, to the 15 nodes that we had, uh, to individuals, to incorporate individual uh, um, folks who wanted to get on, and it worked. 
this year we need you to help us think about that community building to make sure that our intercommunity this year is really about the community and that it's community centered. So you're gonna hear about that. This membership drive issue is totally on our mind. And any ideas people have that are better than ours or will actually grow on ours or are local in nature, I would like to hear from you. Aisha Hazan, is, she knows she's tasked with this. And it's not just about getting numbers, right? We don't want a number. We, not, we need engaged members. And to engage members, they have to get something from us. It's not just we get something from the members. What are we as a society offering to new people to come and join us? Yes, we are offering them a way forward. We're offering them the principles. What more can we offer them? I believe this lies in the chapters because I think it's in the chapters where we have face-to-face, -face, ongoing human kind of association and passion that has grown and then is activated and actually gets results. Uh, but we have to think about what do we want to give these new members that we want so much. Uh, finally, I just want to say something about the fellows and the ambassadors in the next gen uh, part of our absolutely essential uh, work to bring more people in. We must, the internet is about the future. And we must, must, must have the future, which is the present. It's our young people. It is our internet natives. It is the, the folks who have grown up with and about and, and, uh, and around this technology who will better help us reach other people and will better help us as a society to articulate why this internet needs to remain open and global. Why free expression is so important why governments need to understand and appreciate that this uh, technology, this network of networks, is not something they ought to be afraid of, but something they need to embrace. Because it is the way that we are going to express ourselves as communities, grow economies, become stronger in uh, both our regional and our, and our global citizenship. And we need voices in order to do that. Um, in Brazil, I add my voice to all of those. It was fabulous. And to have that energy, to infuse that energy into the internet society, the energy that comes with youth and with um, I can do anything and with fearlessness is what we need now and it must be a part of what we want to do this year. So we're going to concentrate on things we need to do in the present. We have our eye on the future. The scenario planning that we're going to do is enormously important. And we are going to speak. We are going to have our voices heard. I think you are experiencing more and more that the staff of the Internet Society is out in the world trying to make a point, trying to have impact. Uh, I myself will concentrate on two big things this year. One, getting to new audiences so that new audiences understand who we are, why it's important that they listen, and that we be part of the dialogue. Uh, I'll go off to Barcelona in two weeks, because, it, because indeed, this is an, oh, the internet will be on a mobile platform. We need people to understand that and see and understand how it is we go forward. I will be at the G7, because it's at the G7 that governments will again come together and decide how they're gonna govern the internet. Well, really, we don't need them to govern the internet. We need them to join with us to govern ourselves on the internet. And we have to come to some kind of uh, understanding around the needs of security and freedom and the fact that they must go together. Human rights and security are not one balanced against the other, but they must exist at the same time. So we must be in these forums. We'll be at the OECD. We'll be at the African uh, Internet Conference. We're on going to Mexico next week. You will see us out there speaking, and I'm su suggesting to you, you should do the same. Go to where you have people who will listen to you, and go to where they actually don't even know who you are, and start to talk about these issues that are of utmost importance. So again, I want to thank all of you, and uh, Sally, and 
Raul and Olaf and James and all of the staff, um, Greg and the tech, the tech people who put this thing together so that we can talk to each other and ask you to please stay very close to us. Let's stay in touch. Uh, don't ever hesitate to drop me a line. I know we're still trying to work out this stuff on Connect, but by the way, I read everything, so I know what's happening. And I know we have work to do, and I know that we have new kinds of things we have to institute, and we're getting there. So please help us do that, and thank you very much for being here.